I was 14 years old and I walked into a store right by Yankee Stadium in the South Bronx and I came across this novel and I bought it. And I spent my first year in high school reading this at least three to four times because I was so captivated by the story. Uh, when I finally saw the movie um, about a year and a half later on TV uh, from my grandmother's house uh, on a Friday night, I, I was very satisfied, but, you know, of course, it, because it was on TV, they cut off some things and didn't really, you know, didn't really get the full effect. And that was the first time I realized the books are always better. If I can read to you what it says here in the front page, it says, To the Honorable Jeremy Thorne, uh, next ambassador of the United States to the Court of St. James, in London and his wife, Catherine, the gift of a son, Damien, heir to the Thorn Millions, a beautiful child of a beautiful family until dark doubts and sudden violent death begin to chip away at their ordered world. Who is Damien? It came out in 1976, directed by Richard Donner, music by Jerry Goldsmith, starring Gregory Peck, Lee Remick, and a young Harvey Stevens as Damien Thorne. He's a young Damien Thorne, the Antichrist. Those of you who know the story, it's about a family, you know, he's a politician. He's just been, um, you know, sent to England. Um, actually, no, he was actually living in, I think, Rome or something like that. And they lived in Rome for a little while, and, and then I think they moved somewhere else, and then they moved to London because uh, he got assigned to be ambassador to the Court of St. James in England. It's Robert Thorne in the movie. It's Jeremy Thorne in the book. I don't know why they changed it. This movie is, without a doubt, one of the most classic horror films of the late 20th century, okay? This movie was a film like The Exorcist ahead of its time, continuing the, the theme of, of devil, of things that involve Satan and the devil and stuff like that. But unlike The Exorcist, it didn't give you as much the shock value as it gave you more of the suspense and the mystery of who Damien Thorne really is. Was he really the Antichrist or was this just the ravings of a crazy priest who just stormed into the ambassador's office to tell him, gay, hey, guess what? Your son was born of a jackal. You heard me right. A jackal. Those African dogs out there in Africa. Why a jackal? Why couldn't they just get another kind of dog? Why did it have to be that? I don't get it. I guess it adds to the horror of it because as you start seeing the events unfold. The nanny hangs herself. Look at me, Damien. It's all for you. And then the priest shows up and starts warning uh, Thorn about how he's raising the son of the devil because he was there. He was at the birth. He actually participated in it because he sold his soul to the devil. And he wanted to make amends to God by trying to warn Thorn and try to put a stop to the Antichrist before his rise to power and dominance in the world stage according to Bible prophecy, which by that time period in the mid seventies already was already going like this, like a like a vortex of, of like ooh ah ooh amongst the general public because there's been all these books that were coming out around that time um, by a guy named Hal Lindsey who was a who was a Christian writer who wrote a lot of books about the coming Antichrist and the end of the world and what's going to happen in the world stage before the end of the world and things of that nature. So this was already kind of like formulating at the time. That was the zeitgeist of the time, right? So when this movie came out, it came out at the right time and it actually became a huge success. Well, what was crazy was that the concept of how Damien was even born, you see, here, here's how it went down. They, the jackal got impregnated by Satan, supposedly. Um, in what form and how, I cannot describe it. But then what happened was that he eventually 
um, you know, they eventually took the dog to the basement of a hospital in Rome where it gave birth to the boy. Now, considering it was a human baby or supposedly a human baby coming out of a dog, the dog died, got killed or whatever. And then they took Catherine Thorne's baby, which was actually very healthy. They killed it. To, to to kind of bring in Damien, the, 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 you know, they cleaned him up, they made sure he was fine, and then they put him up there in the maternity ward in Rome, and when Robert Thorne showed up, the priest who was behind the whole scheme, another priest who sold his soul to the devil, Father Spoleto, told him, hey, guess what? Your wife gave birth to a stillborn, lie, but here's another baby, just don't tell her, lie, you know, lies on lies on lies, right? And he, they took, you know, he did it because he wanted to um, save her mental uh, capacity to, to, to you know, she, he thought she was going to, like, freaking lose it and that he was going to lose her as a result. Um, so it was fear, if you think about it. At the, from the very beginning, it was always fear that, that started. That was the first domino that was pushed. He willfully took this child secretly um, into his home. And by the time he was five years old, that's when things started happening. Uh, the other priest shows up, warns Robert. Catherine's pregnant again. He's going to kill the baby while it's still in her. Uh, it's going to kill her. Eventually, he's going to kill you. He's going to take all that's yours. You know, what's yours? What's your family's? And he's going to, like, take over the world. He's going to, he's the Antichrist. He is the son of the devil, as prophesied in the book of Revelation. He gets help from a photographer who finds weird images in the in the photographs of things that are going on uh, with the vic the people that eventually get that die in in a sort of strange kind of in mysterious ways. If you think of the movie Final Destination, it kind of is like that. Like how did that happen? These are like freak accidents, you know. Except for maybe the the nanny, the first one, she straight up just committed suicide right there in front of a in a birthday party. In front of kids. In front of kids. Okay? That was... That wasn't cool. What I loved was... If you watch this film... The... This is... Again, it's not... Like The Exorcist. It's not a trauma... Kind of like... Gut-wrenching thing. There's only one scene where... The, decap the decapitation scene. Okay? Towards the end. But then at the very end, when he fights off his new nanny, who is a disciple of the Antichrist, Mrs. Balak, uh, also responsible for his wife's death earlier in the film, he takes Damien to the church with the seven daggers of Megiddo given to him by the exorcist slash archaeologist Bugenhagen, the last of a long line of Bugenhagens throughout history that their main mission was to keep the evil one from walking the face of the earth, right? He gave Thorne the daggers. He gave Thorne the daggers. Told him how to use them. Got to use all seven of them. Think about that for a second. I want you to think about that for a second. You had to use all seven daggers to implant into a five-year-old on an altar in a church. That That's, you know, putting that kind of pressure on a parent goes a long way, you know. And considering everything that had happened to to uh, Gregory Peck's character, Robert Thorne, in this film, you know, even almost towards the end, he couldn't, even even at the end, he, he, he almost couldn't bring himself to do it. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously we saw what eventually happened. Uh, you know, the police came, and then you see that little smile at the, at the funeral back in the States of Damien looking at the screen and you hear that satanic music, that Latin chant saying Ave Satani in Latin, Hail Satan in Latin, Forsus Christus in Latin, meaning false Christ, antichrist. You know, uh, I don't know about you, but you know, Jerry Goldsmith was next to John Williams, one of the greatest music composers for movie soundtracks ever like he's made so many incredible soundtracks for so many other films throughout the um throughout the years but 
his unique, the, what makes the Omen so unique, and the films that came after, it, you, you know, because he did the music for those too, is the, is the, you know, is the, the satanic chant, you know, like, it, it's creepy as hell, you know, when you first hear it, you, you get, you get, your, 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 you get goosebumps, and you freak out a little bit, like, my God, you know, can you imagine, you know, what is happening to the world. And what's crazy, what's the most craziest part about it is that the main antagonist of the film, which would be Damien himself, this five-year-old kid, right? He didn't have to do anything. He didn't have to do anything. As a matter of fact, he didn't even know, in essence, who he was. He doesn't find out until the second film, which we're not talking about in this video. But there were powers, you know, the satanic demonic powers that were keeping him safe and and making sure that things were going in a certain direction in order for him to claim his, I guess, throne eventually in this world, which the next two films afterwards um, show. The Omen um, was a film not just of horror. It was a film of the sublime inner fear that we all have of the future of what is to come. We don't know what's coming. We don't know who's coming. And when he does come, will he be our savior or will he be our end? It's a beautiful, it's a, it's a beautifully well-crafted movie written by David Seltzer, the book. If you read the book, you, you I couldn't put it down. You know, like there are times when I go to certain parts that so I can remember, you know, what, what certain things that, that I might have almost forgot that helps connect and puts more glue to the story. Now, are there a little bit of things in this movie that because it's a 70s movie, you're going to kind of see it's a little silly? Yeah, you know, but what 70s horror movie didn't give you some of that anyway, right? So I'm not trying to make excuses here. I'm just stating the facts. I'm going to give The Omen five coffee cups, the top of the notch. It is a classic. It is in my collection. And when it comes out on 4K in digital mode, I am buying it. Yeah, I'm going to do that because this is that kind of film. I loved its remake that came out in 2006. I think it was very faithful to the original film. Uh, and I liked how they tried to incorporate it into a more modern sense of the early 2000s. Cell phones, computers stuff like that, and I actually enjoyed um, the idea that they actually took some things from this book in that movie that didn't come out in the 1976 version, and only people who read the book and are well-versed in it would know that and would catch that, like me, so kudos to them for that. Oh yeah, one more thing, um, my favorite scene was the cemetery scene, when they, when Robert and, and Jennings, um, the photographer, were looking for the grave of Damien's true mother and Robert's real child. That when you open that crypt and saw the lifeless skeleton of the baby with head trauma, that's not something you see often in, in horror movies, especially from that time period, right? You don't, you don't, you know, you didn't see the act. You, you, you find out exactly what happens to the baby in the book. How that baby got that head trauma. You, you read it here, and it's not cool. It's actually quite disturbing. Very disturbing. So, you know, so that's why I'm giving this a retro review now. In this month of October, right before Halloween. Please, go check it out if you haven't seen it. Okay? Um, and if... If you haven't seen the remake and you saw the original, go see the remake. You won't be disappointed. I was very impressed with how they managed to put that together. There are differences. There are subtle, quite a few differences. A lot of people kind of think, oh, it's the same thing. But it, no, there were some parts that were like, oh, that's different. They did something different there. You know, they even added something else that wasn't like a, an extra death in the, in the, um, they added an extra death early on in the in the remake that was never in the movie it's not even in the book i'm like okay 
sure. You know, like, fine. You know, it, it didn't mess the plot up or anything, thank God, you know, but it's good, you know, hey, you know what? Why not, right? How can you possibly, knowing me, eventually think that I would never review this film? Of course I would. It's one of my favorite horror films of all time. It's up there with The Exorcist. It's up there with Halloween. It's up there with Friday the 13th. It's up there with Alien. It's it's in that level. All right? So let me know what you think. Talk to me. Comment below. Share with me your thoughts on the classic 1976 film about the end of the world, or at least the beginning of the end, in the form of a five-year-old boy, the beast, with the number 666 in the head. Antichrist, Ralph Perez, Horror and Coffee. Take care.